Hello and welcome um, all of you. And thanks really so much for joining us. Um, my name is Julia Himberg um, and I'm the director of Film and Media Studies. Um, this is the second of three alumni panels we're hosting this semester. And one of the main reasons that we're hosting these panels is really because our goal with FMS is to help you become you know, more critically informed writers, storytellers, critics, consumers of film and media. So we really want you to leave the program with a set of concrete and valuable skill sets that lead you to employment opportunities, you know, in fields across the media industries. And so as part of that process, these alumni panels are designed to give you essentially examples of the various types of careers that are possible with an FMS degree. Um, and of course, also to gain insight um, into some useful strategies for making the transition from college to career. And today's topic, the road less taken, pandemic challenges and unforeseen opportunities has been designed to specifically address our current moment and to answer questions and concerns you may have about navigating the media industries right now. So um, let's go ahead and really get started. Um, I'm going to introduce you to our two moderators who are current FMS students, um, and they have graciously agreed to moderate today's session. They are then going to introduce you to our panelists and we'll get started. Um, if you have questions along the way, please feel free to put them in the chat and we'll do our best to get to as many of them as possible. Um, so please do that, you know, anytime you have a question and we'll do our best to keep track of them. So um, on to our moderators. Um, our first moderator is Kale Epps, who is a senior at ASU majoring in FMS with a concurrent major in history and a minor in anthropology. And um, we're very proud to say this fall, he will begin an MA um, graduate program in cinema and media studies at USC School of Cinematic Arts. Our second moderator um, is Alex Botello, and Alex is a junior at ASU, majoring in FMS with a minor in theater. Um, he also enjoys studies in various mediums and their social effects on marginalized groups, as well as studying performance in screen acting and voice work. And he also currently serves as PR and branding chairs for several organizations, including those in multicultural Greek life and a local construction business. So. Thank you both for being here today. And Kale, I will pass it to you. Thank you, Dr. Himberg. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I'd like to first introduce uh, Elizabeth Schroeder. Hello, Elizabeth. Good to see you again. Uh, she graduated the class of 2021. Elizabeth is currently working as a social media manager at Spark Growth Strategies. Since graduation, she has actively continued to apply for jobs in the entertainment industry with the hopes of working in development or in a writer's room. Uh, thanks for being here. And um, I, I'd also like to introduce Rain Simmons. Good to see you as well uh, again, Rain. Uh, Rain graduated the class of 2018. After graduating, she moved to New York uh, to work with Material as a full-time research manager in the market research and insights industry, focusing on luxury, lifestyle, beauty, and entertainment research. In her free time, she also worked on various entertainment sets as a production assistant and freelanced as an editor and creative consultant. She has moved back to Arizona and splits her time here between uh, between here and LA to pursue film and media full time. And I'll uh, pass it over to Alex now. Gotcha. Thank you for the introduction on both Elizabeth and Rain. And next, we'll go ahead and introduce Sam. So Sam currently is the class of 2020, currently a full-time brand strategist at Siegel and Gale. They've also worked for brand consultancies, creative agencies, and market research startups on brands including IBM, TikTok, Jägermeister, and Frito-Lay. They manage consultant part partnerships for Do The Work, an organization with the mission to increase queer creativity and share the voice within the advertising industry. In their spare time, they are a stand-up comedian and a cat dad. Okay, uh, so let's just jump on, uh, jump on in. The first question we have for our panelists is, uh, what challenges have you faced since the pandemic began, either in your job search or in your uh, current career position? And um, Sam, why don't we pass that over to you first? 
Sure. Um, so I graduated May of 2020, uh, which was an awesome time to get into advertising because they had just cut like 20% of the workforce uh, and started with junior people. So um, I was competing with, yeah, people with a year or two years, three years more experience than myself for jobs that didn't exist. Um, but what was really cool about it was people were really understanding of the situation I was in. So reaching out to people like cold emailing people on LinkedIn um, proved to be very effective. And I was able to build a killer network um, with all that free time. Awesome. Yeah, uh, thanks for that, Sam. Uh, That's uh, very helpful. Uh, How about you, Rain? Uh, the question is, what challenges have you faced since the pandemic began, either in your job search or in your current position? Right. So um, when the pandemic uh, first started, I was working with material as a research manager. Thankfully, I'd had some years experience with them, Sam. So I, I was with the com- like I was one of those who was like waiting to see. Um, and thankfully, my company didn't have that many layoffs. Um, but really for me, it was, I spent a lot of, of my free time and my weekends and afternoons doing set work, um, and like PA work, um, which if some of you have like entered into that foray, like you can get a call one day and it's like, okay, can you be here tomorrow to do this? And that work just dropped off. So, um, not only did that work for me drop off, but it dropped off for everyone in the industry as we can imagine, um, and remember for some of us. So, really the challenges was figuring out if the job that I was in, which was as a research manager, that was a job that I wanted to stay in, or if that was, um, or if I needed to take a step back and and look towards focusing more on creative work instead. So biggest challenge there, I would say is, is really like, I think this happened for a lot of us. Um, when the pandemic happened, that perspective of like, what am I doing with my life? Like everything stopped. What am I doing? What's important to me? So um, that was the biggest challenge I'd say. Yeah. Thank you for, uh, thank you for sharing that with us. It's very helpful. Uh, how about you, Elizabeth? I'm guessing you sort of jumped into looking for a job sort of like right in the middle of the pandemic. So uh, the question is, what challenges have you faced since the pandemic began, either in your job search or in your current position? Yeah, you know, I uh, I graduated in 2021. And so, um, you know, I have that perspective of I was in college during the pandemic and now still like, you know, applying for jobs during it too. And so um, I think I, at least like with graduating in 2021, I did, you know, people had sort of gotten used to the the virtual job search and things, but it definitely, as far as looking for a job, it made it very difficult of, you know, I was in Arizona, uh, living in Arizona for a little bit um, with the intention to move out to LA. And so it was sort of like navigating or certain companies were, um, you know, they were hoping to go back in person soon. And so you know, even if you weren't in LA, they still wanted you to be in LA. And so it was sort of navigating that, what jobs can I apply for? Or how can I, you know, work in this remote, um, you know, workplace or market while still, you know, targeting the companies in LA and sort of just navigating that. And um, a lot of the issues that, or things, the challenges that have come up are, um, especially with the Delta variant, the Omicron variant, there's there's been a lot of, um, oh, now we're going to go back in person. Oh, wait, two months later. So it's been a lot of navigating that of companies either holding back on hiring or hiring a lot of people. And so it's just, it's been a, it's been a bit of a roller coaster as far as the, um, will you, will, will they, will they not go back in person? And that's sort of the, the part that I've been navigating. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. That's really helpful. I just wanted to um, uh, mention to uh, everyone here as well, if you have questions, uh, feel free to throw them in the chat and um, we'll try to get to some of those at the end. And uh, I'll pass it over to Alex now. 
Thank you. Yeah, no, I definitely appreciate that. I know this, we're all living in tough, tough times and um, we've all faced challenges and um, kind of segueing into our next question. And this is more geared towards our undergraduate uh, students here. Uh, what advice would you guys uh, give to current students who are nervous about entering the media relations job field uh, in the current health climate? Uh, we can go ahead and we'll go backwards. So we'll start uh, Elizabeth. Yeah, I would say um, that I would recommend while you are still in school to try and apply for remote internships. Um, my senior year, so spring of 2021, I was able to intern with a production company that was based in LA. Um, and so that sort of gave me a good opportunity to better understand how the entertainment industry works, um, you know, figure out how it used to work, how it's working now. And so I think while you're still in school, try as much as you can to get those remote experiences. Um, you know, while companies are going back in person, a lot of the internships are still remote. Um, so I would just, my best, or my biggest advice is just to try and take advantage of like the, as many opportunities as you can while you're still a student um, or, you know, while you're still a student and while things are still very much hybrid and um, some things are still remote, you know. Gotcha. No, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Rain? Yeah, um, I think my biggest advice right now is probably to like trust your gut as far as what you want to pursue. Um, as you've heard already, uh, looking for a job is a job in itself and it's even more difficult right now. And so it's not going to be useful to you to spend time looking for work that you are not passionate about. Um, there's a lot of positions that are open, especially um, in the inter like especially in the entertainment field. If you're looking to go to office, like focus on what you really want to do. Um, but also taking advantage of being an undergrad and having extra time um, to start applying now. So depending on when you're graduating or if you're you know, about to enter the field this summer, et cetera, um, if you want to have a job straight out of college, like look for it right now. Um, you start now. It usually takes, I, no one told me this until I was looking, but it usually takes like six to six to eight months, I think, to find a position um, and, you know, sometimes you look out and you find the position sooner, but start looking now because you don't know what you don't know. So if you start now and you start to expose yourself to the work that's out there, you can, you can better focus and hone in on like what you actually want to do and figure out those job titles that actually like mean something to you. So that's my advice. Gotcha. Thanks for that advice. And then next up, Sam. Yeah, um, I kind of jumped the gun in my last answer, but network like that, that has made my entire career. Um, it's like $31 a month to get the LinkedIn premium. Um, and you can message people who are not near network. And that is $30 well spent, um, especially closer to the time. Um, you know, if you're three years out from graduating, like it ends up adding up to like a thousand dollars, but you know, pay for it when it's useful if you can. Um, but you definitely don't need it. For me, it was definitely like, like I said, I was applying for jobs that didn't like, there were no jobs. Right. So like I was just looking at companies. So I kind of reached out to two groups of people. I reached out to people who were doing the roles that I thought might be interesting to me to talk to their experiences about it, see what advice they had and see how they broke in. Um, because kind of like advertising similar to more traditional entertainment and media is just super competitive. Um, so getting a sense of what they did to stand out was really helpful. Um, and having the audacity to reach out to CEOs um, because frankly, people don't do it. Um, so you, they're, they're getting bombarded with stuff every day, but like, if you reach out respectfully and boldly and include a point of relevance as to like why they want to talk to you, whether that's you're super passionate about something that they've specifically done um, or something the company has done or just something interesting about you, like it really works. Um, I talked to a bunch of CEOs at massive companies just speak and they're like, no one ever reaches out to me to talk. So like take advantage of that white space. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's, that's the big thing. So then when jobs popped up, like 
I was able to reach out to people at those companies and say, hey, we talked six months ago. Like, I see there's a job now. Like, what do I do? And then they were very willing to help. All right. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, you heard it. Reach out to all CEOs. <laughs> um, but next, uh, we're going to go ahead and take it back to Cal. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, uh, before we move on to the next question, I, I thought that advice was so helpful, like really tangible about the LinkedIn premium. And I'd be curious if Rain or Elizabeth, if you had any like, like actual uh, uh, strategies that you've employed over, over the past few years um, that, you know, where you could say this got me this job uh do, do, do you have would you have either one of you want to jump in with that um any any uh strategies that you have to share uh yeah i'll jump in um uh i would say the network thing that sam is talking about absolutely that's it i have used linkedin similar ways more so to uh, like sam was saying like gauge the life um, of, a, of a job or things like that. But for me, more beneficially has uh, things that have been more beneficial as my actual in like real life networking. Um, Julia Hemberg is like my go-to. She's like my ace. Um, do not underestimate the power and the um, grace of your professors, like at your school. Uh, a lot of our, like a lot of the faculty at ASU still works, is still engaged. That's why they're the best faculty. Um, but talk to your professors and make those connections in school with your professors, with the people in your classes, because that's, uh, I, that's the only way that I've like hit a job actually in like my, in my whole career at this point, um, online networking is great. It's great to have those people in your pocket, but, um, the in-person connections that I've built like in school is, is excellent. And like, people will tell you like the film industry and the entertainment industry and marketing industry is who, you know, and it seems like it's lofty and you need to know someone who's like, you know, this big, fortune 500 person, but every job that I've ever gotten has either come from a peer or um, a, a professor or a mentor of mine. So keep, make, do not underestimate your, the people that you're around right now. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you. How about you, Elizabeth? Anything to add? Yeah, I think um, there is a bit of construction too going on in my apartment. So if you hear background noise, apologize. Um, but yeah, I think you know, just piggybacking off of that, the internship that I mentioned um, that I had gotten my last semester of college, I don't, you know, I had done, um, a, I had gone to like an ASU networking event, um, a, the film career boot camp, And in that program, you meet a lot of industry people. Um, and, you know, they tell you to send thank you notes afterwards. Um, and, you know, they tell you to stay in contact with them. Some people do, some people don't. Um, but I was really persistent of, you know, sending the the required thank you note, but then a few months later, reaching out to them, telling them I was looking for an internship, um, you know, just to see if they knew of anything, any advice. And one of them just offered me the internship right away. And then that sort of got me into that, you know, how important it is to send thank you notes to follow up and just sort of make those connections. And in my job search, you know, the connections that I made in that program are, you know, the people that I rely on, you know, they'll, they'll send me job postings now, or they'll reach out on my behalf, like before I go in for an interview. Um, and then, you know, even one thing I will say about networking too, you know, if you're given an interview, take it, even if it's not necessarily for a job that, you know, you think you're qualified for or that you think you would want. Um, Cause there have been a few different times where I've gone into an interview and impressed the person, but you know, I didn't get the position itself, but they put me up or they passed along my resume to somebody else. And so, you know, you don't really know where your network will come from. So it's just sort of, or, you know, it could come from people you would least expect. And so it's, you know, your professors, you know, people that you meet in networking events, people you interview with, um, you know, the thank you notes go a long way um, and following up with people and just being genuine about it too, I think is the biggest thing because anyone can say, 
oh, thank you. I had a good time talking with you. And then just sort of leave it like that. But making those notes personalized and, you know, re- researching the companies beforehand, doing that sort of extra work will help you stand out and then make your network a lot more solid and, um, you know, stronger. Gotcha, gotcha. And really quick, we are getting some questions in the chat and we'll just answer a few of them and then we'll jump back to ours. So from Autumn, and this is for all three of you, uh, it says, hi, I am an online student and I am finding um, making meaningful connections difficult uh, being virtual. Are there any tips to uh, circumvent that? I think Sam especially is um, great to answer this question because he was an ASU online student um, and not living in the area as well. So Sam, I thought maybe we'd pass it to you first. Sure. Um, Yeah, so I was lucky in that I was um, going through Starbucks. So actually like two people at my store um, were also doing ASU and also FMS people. um, But they um that more that didn't end up like really being um helpful in terms of um finding work but was really helpful in terms of building camaraderie so i think that taking advantage of geography is um valuable because like obviously i was able to get the educational component of going to school and i had access to you know the career resources and to my professors and all of that um and did make some connections, honestly, through Twitter with other students. Um, But really, like relying on um, having access to people locally was good. So I don't know where you are. um, But if there are other FMS students, or just ASU online students in your area, that would be a great way to start. Um, Yeah. Sweet. Uh, Elizabeth or Rain, did you want to touch on that? Um, Yeah, just a little. Um, I was in person for the most part of my uh, college career, but towards the end, I moved more online. Um, I think, yeah, I'm not sure your geography or your location, but um, just understanding that like it doesn't stop on like on, I don't know if you guys still use Blackboard or if you're using Canvas, no idea, but it doesn't stop on the online platform that you're using. So, you know, your teacher, I, when I was like going through online courses, there was a lot of discussion boards, um, using those discussion boards as like jumping off points. That's like, I'd love to talk to you about this more. Like, do you want to jump on a FaceTime call? You don't necessarily have to make a meaningful connection, like in person, that connection can still happen virtually. So use the people that are in your courses and um, from Maryland. Oh, cool. East coast. Um, But yeah, you can build those connections from the people in your courses, even though it's not real life, you can always set up a FaceTime or a zoom call with someone to talk about your coursework. Right. So that's my perspective. I did that a lot. (laughs) Yeah, and all all I'll add to that, because I just second everything that's already been said, um, I would just take advantage of Zoom calls and, you know, try and what, even if you can't be in person and you can't meet up with someone, um, like physically, uh, you know, creating a a space where you can have that face-to-face communication and, you know, if, you know, if first, you know, first meetings and stuff like that make you nervous, um, you know, doing something over Zoom or over FaceTime, you know, you can think about it like you're you're in your own space. There's that sort of comfort and um, you can try and, you know, use that to sort of motivate you and like give you a bit of comfort. You know, you can have little notes off to the side uh, when it's virtual. And so there, even though it may be difficult doing things virtually, there are some advantages that, um, you know, that you can that you can use uh, while we're still in this sort of space. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, So the third question we have, uh, and all of you have sort of alluded to this, but maybe, uh, and Rain, um, maybe you could, uh, uh, we'll start with you on this one. Uh, But the question is, um, as the industry began to shift uh, uh, due to the pandemic, how did you pivot your approach to staying involved 
in media related industries? Um, yeah, so I consider myself a multi hyphenate. I have a lot of interests and I'm committed to exploring all of those interests. So um, when work died down, um, I guess from the top down, uh, it started from the bottom up. So uh, that meant like making my like focusing on my personal projects. Um, that meant working more with my friends on um, work independently, right? That meant um, just going smaller scale, just because if this is something that you're passionate about, I really encourage you to start thinking about the personal work that you can do in your, in your own space. So that was the pivot was really just like get finding an outlet for the creative work that I wanted to be doing. So I worked on a couple of music videos for some friends. Um, and I was back in Arizona for like six months in, from the beginning of the pandemic. So that was working on like more guerrilla style shooting, more um, photography work. Um, one of my really good friends did like FaceTime photo shoots, which was like really sweet and like a nice little memento now. Um, so it really just felt like, I guess it turned in instead of out. So um, I think I answered the question, <laughs> but yeah. It's an amazing answer. Thank you. Yeah, it was really fabulous. Thanks. Sam, how about you? Uh, the question was, how, uh, as the industry began to shift uh, due to the pandemic, how did you pivot your approach to staying involved in media-related industries? Yeah, I think very similar to Rain. I mean, one of my main creative outlets is stand-up, which literally requires being in the room with people. Um, and some people took their stand up online um, and did Zoom shows, which honestly um, sounded excruciating to me. Uh, so I did not do that. Um, but similarly, I had to find another outlet for my creativity. So, like, a lot of that for me was in like finding that in writing, um, which, like, I think, yeah, I think that that's always like being a creative person needing to find an outlet. Um, and realizing that, yeah, I'm going to explore lots of different mediums um, and can find satisfaction in all of them. And that also helps like fill time, um, which we had all of a sudden I had so much of. Um, so that was that was super helpful, just like not even in terms of career, but just in terms of like my own mental health. Um, really, like, I feel like there's such a focus, like at least here in America that like everything should be about work all the time. Um, and I feel like generationally, like we're shifting away from that and I love to see it and I love to be a part of that. Um, but like not being as engaged or like obsessed with like monetizing everything I was doing, um, like having that paradigm shift was really helpful, um, as well. Thank you, Sam. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Uh, how about you, Elizabeth? Uh, as the industry began to shift due to the pandemic, how did you pivot your approach to staying involved in media-related industries? Yeah, I would say that um, something that I did, like as sort of the pandemic started and we all had a lot more free time, um, you know, I feel like there are always those movie, those classic movies or TV shows that people always, re you, you know, you hear professors professors referencing class and stuff like that like and I just I had never seen them and so with that free time I tried to you know get a list of those classic movies and sort of like work through them and watch them um you know because I had so much time and you know you can only watch reality tv so many times before it gets repetitive and so you know instead of just sitting around watching shows I had already seen before I was trying to go back, watch something that someone had mentioned to me for whatever reason, that was an essential movie to see. And, you know, and so I just tried to build that up. And so it's like, I, you know, since I had the time to watch those things, do that. Um, and also, you know, finding podcasts and just like different things like that to sort of stay in touch with what's currently happening in the industry. Um, yeah. And so that's just sort of something that even as we shift back to being, you know, starting to sort of get out of this, you know, you can still do that, like set aside one night a week to be like, okay, I'm going to watch tonight. I'm going to watch a classic movie or, you know, find a podcast, um, 30 minutes, an hour or something, and just like listen to it, um, just to sort of be in touch with what's going on. Um, you know, it's a small thing, but I think over time it can really help you 
you know, get into the, get in touch with things going on. I am just going to echo Elizabeth because that is actually like a huge, that was a huge, huge deal. I got a Criterion collection subscription at the beginning of the pandemic because I was like, you know what, this is work technically. (laughs) Awesome. Thank you for those answers. Uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Alex. Yeah, no, thank you so much. I think that last one, Elizabeth, or the entire answer really about just keeping kind of like a, like a sheet, a spreadsheet of everything. I know I got one. I got so many Netflix shows I got to get through. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, our next and fourth question is um, kind of with this like overarching like pandemic, um, you know, uh, life happens. Um, have you any of you experienced any unforeseen opportunities during this time? If so, can you briefly describe them? I know this is an overloaded question, or it can be. So, whoever wants to jump, whichever one of you guys, go ahead. I'm happy to start. Um, yeah, lots, honestly, because even though lots of people in my industry were laid off, agencies realized that there was a whole batch of like talent graduating and then, and then another one and another one before things recovered. Um, so in my case, lots of ad agencies put out programs that were just six week programs once a week for an hour where they would just like talk about something. So like that was a good way to learn about the culture of those specific agencies. That was a good thing that I could put on my resume. This was a good way so that I could speak intelligently about my industry. And it was a good way to identify who to reach out to on LinkedIn and gave me that point of relevance. So it was, it was, hey, I came into contact with you at X agency's event. Like, I heard you talk about this. I related to this. Could we talk more? Like, that was very much um, helpful in that. Also, people being home meant that they could hop on a networking Zoom call at 2 p.m. in the afternoon in a way that maybe they couldn't in the office. Um, and, like, people were just more empathetic, I think, to the struggle just because, like, everyone was having a hard time. Um, so that that was a huge opportunity, not to mention all the internships going remote, like meant that like you could be anywhere. Um, like I happen to be in New York and advertising is huge here, um, but I can track back almost every opportunity I've had to a program that was put on through Reddit that got me an interview for an internship in Philadelphia. And like everyone I've met, I can track back to like that singular experience, um, which is wild. Um, so it's, yeah, there were lots of opportunities um, because of it. Sweet. Thank you, Sam. Uh, Rain, have you experienced any unforeseen opportunities during this time? If so, can you briefly describe them? Yeah, um, I would say, generally speaking, unforeseen opportunities is just going freelance. Um, I am not a freelance person. I well, I am now. That's why I'm like, this. it's unforeseen. I'm still adjusting. Um, a lot of people, because a lot of companies got rid of a lot of people and a lot of smaller businesses really scaled back as well. They, some of the things that they still needed, like they still needed. And so I got a lot of people who were asking, oh, can I do this? Or can I do this? And for a long time, I would say no, because it was like, well, I work for this company and I don't really feel like doing this individual project. Um, But because everything was so scaled back, it was like, okay, I guess I can make this animation or I guess I can edit this video for you. So I've suddenly at this point have like a, a freelance, like, like, uh, I don't even know what to call it. I don't want to call it a business because I have no idea what's going on, but basically saying yes more often than saying no, um, has really been the, I guess the unforeseen opportunity. And from here, just being able to say, okay, well, I have all this work now under my belt. Um, and what am I going to do with that? So that's pretty much, that's what that, that's what I have to say about that. I think. Gotcha. Thank you, Rain. And Elizabeth, uh, have you experienced any unforeseen opportunities during this time? If so, can you describe them? Yeah, I think a little bit of what both of them were saying as far as, you know, obviously internships going remote, but, um, you know, recently, uh, like in my introduction, Alex mentioned, like, I'm, you know, I'm doing, or I'm a social media manager right now, and it's a freelance position. And so, Um, working freelance, it gives me, it's a completely remote job. Um, You know, it gives me the flexibility to say, you know, oh, I'm not working, uh, you know, for a few hours, I have an alumni panel or, oh, I have an interview. And so 
it, it it's been giving me the flexibility I need to continue, you know, continue applying for jobs, continue taking interviews, um, and pursuing what I ultimately want to do while still helping me build the administrative skills that all assistants need um, and is a big requirement just to get into the industry. And so, um, yeah, I think just finding remote work has been, it's, it's helped me, you know, keep up that momentum to keep applying and stuff versus, you know, working an in-person job, you know, at waitressing or at a coffee shop where, you know, you got to do what you got to do to make the bills. But, you know, working a remote job, it's a lot less like physically exhausting. It's a lot easier to, you know, do send applications out or write or do whatever you want to do um, in your free time because you're just, you're less exhausted. And so I think, you know, freelance and remote work has really been um, something I never saw myself doing, but I've really been enjoying it. And, um, you know, it's also something that once I do get into the industry, I can do on the weekends for some extra money. And so um, it was definitely an unforeseen opportunity that um, is very exciting and I like it. (laughs) Gotcha. I appreciate it. All right, we're gonna jump to a few of the uh, chat questions. Um, This one, I kind of want to point towards maybe Rain, because I know you talked a little bit about um, networking in terms of with professors and stuff. So Arlise asked, how would you go in talking to your professors about, uh, to ask about internships? Um, So first off, like make sure you have a relationship with your professors. <laughs> your professors are people and they're usually very cool people. I see some very cool professors of mine on the chat today. So um, make sure you have a relationship with your professors. Uh, talk to them uh, about your work, about the working class, about your work outside of class or the work that you want to do. That way they get to know you um, and you get to know them as well. So that's where it starts is actually like being an active participant in your courses. Um, and then from there, your prof- you know, they know what you're going through. Your professors know what your, what your coursework is like. They know what your, uh, you know, your graduation plan looks like. Um, so they are aware. I actually did not, I wasn't thinking about looking for jobs for a very long time until Professor Hemberg was like, hey, you're graduating soon. What do you want to do? And I was like, That's a good question. So um, that just came out of a natural conversation that I was having with my professor. So the first step is to actually garner a connection with your professor. Um, On one hand, obviously, they are your educators. They are your instructors. Um, But so, you know, you there is like an expectation of being guided there, but also understand that they have their own they're pursuing as well. And so this isn't necessarily, don't try not to think about it so transactionally, but that your professors are your mentors, you know what I mean? And they can be your mentors. Um, So starting number one, once you build a connection with your professor, your things flow naturally. Um, But starting there, and then if you're interested in something, um, connecting with about maybe what your resume looks like, um, what your cover letter might look like, and that way they can guide you in that respect and also give you more perspective on how to improve or um, where to look. So that's what I have to say. Yeah. Gotcha. Thank you. Really quick, uh, either Elizabeth or Sam, did you guys want to answer that one? The question was, how would you go in talking to your professors about internships? Oh, um, oh. Right, I'll, okay, sorry. Um, I don't know. I would say that, because um, I think I, I did that when I was in college. And so I think, um, I guess, like, it, it can seem very daunting, you know, like, it, it can be very nerve wracking. But, you know, just sending that email of just being like, hey, I'd love to come to your office hours. I'm really interested in this or in that. And, you know, because they are there for you, like, you know, I feel like professors sometimes like, you know, people don't go to their office hours. Like they're, they're excited. If, if you, if you put it out there that you want to talk to them or you want to meet with them about something, like it'll make their day. So even if it is, it may seem daunting, like, I would just say, just do it. You know, it takes five minutes to send a quick email. Um, And so sometimes I think just sort of, you know, doing it um, and getting that ball rolling will 
um, it'll help you in the long run. Yeah. I just wanted to jump in before Sam goes, just to say, I see um, to your point, Elizabeth, I see Dr. Bradley and Dr. Martinez's heads nodding um, and mine going as well, which is, you know, we are always excited to talk with you and learn more about you um, and what your interests are. I remember with Rain, for example, um, she wanted to go to New York. Like that was sort of the place was the sort of starting point, right? It was like, this is my dream is to go here and I want to start there. Um, and so that was one of the sort of ways we started talking about, okay, well then what, you know, kinds of options um, would you be interested in and, and talking through those things? So please do take advantage of those office hours. I know right now they're primarily by Zoom and I know that can be a little intimidating um, in some ways, but um, as Rain said, we're just people too, and we're always delighted to talk to you. So um, I speak, I think, on behalf of all FMS faculty that we welcome you coming and talking to us, and we're here to help. So Sam, sorry to cut you off. Go right ahead. No, that's great. Um, yeah, I think that the first thing is like remembering that your professors are people too, and people first. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but also I think that like, more broadly even it applies like i know for me like there have been many like emails i've been nervous to send or reaching out to professors for help with internships or negotiating my salary um and these conversations are conversations that you will not be the first one to do this you will not be the first person to reach out to a professor and say hey can you help me with an internship like uh, hopefully right um uh, like you just won't be um and you won't be the first person to negotiate ask for more money when you get an offer and like aside like absolutely do that um like they expect you to they're lowballing you like ask for more money um but yeah i think that that's just important implies broadly is like especially when sending an email the re receiving person unless you say i'm feeling like this sending the email doesn't know how you feel when you hit send so like don't worry about it um and yeah just like remembering for me that like i'm not the first person to reach out to this person like this is is always valuable um yeah. Um, a last note on that. It, it's good practice for interviews as well. Um, you're, it's it never, it's never going to stop. Like you're going to be doing this like networking questioning game for, for forever, as long as you're like pursuing a career. Um, so doing it in undergrad is like the best prep. So take advantage of that. Gotcha. Appreciate all three of you on that one. Back over to Kale. Thanks, Alex. Uh, okay, so yeah, I think this might be our final question um, aside from the chat, but uh, the question is, what is slash was the most shocking change you encountered post-graduation in relation to industry reactions to the pandemic? Um, and if anyone has a, an immediate response to that, go ahead and jump in. Anyone? What what was the most shocking change you encountered post graduation in relation to industry reactions to the pandemic? Rain, uh, don't mean to put you on the spot, but what, what do you what do you think? I know you've done a lot of PA work, so yeah, yeah I would a good one. I would say actually um, that there's more jobs now uh, on set, which is like super surprising. Um, a lot of them have to do with like COVID management. Um, but it's, I think we've heard this before getting on set is like the first step when you're on set, you're it's excellent. But also that I have so many friends who've been like COVID, um, like, um, I can't remember COVID coordinators. And there's a couple of other titles of this, but basically like it's when everyone comes to set, you have to do their temperature check and you have to do their swab and et cetera. Um, but you get to see everybody. So everyone is coming through you first. Um, and that was a job that I did once that, um, uh, was, was like in October, in October of 2020, um, when I first moved back to New York and I ended up meeting, um, one of the art department leads who got me another job later, just from our interaction during this like COVID check-in. So surprising change is that there's, there's more jobs on set to be done actually. And, um, more individuals have, uh, like COVID management, um, people. So there is 
that's, I think, the most shocking thing. And that um, the industry itself is even more flexible. So there is like a, there is now, it's not as widespread yet as I would love it to be, but there is a, a lot more focus on respect and, um, and time management on sets and um, opportunities. So there is, sets are a friendlier place right now. And I think that that is the most surprising thing to me is that, I mean, before the pandemic, I was on set and it was like, I would show up to set. People were like, don't talk to this person. Don't talk to this person. Come to me only, et cetera. So you're like living in a silo. And now just because you can only have a certain amount of people on set, you can only have a certain amount of um, like junior or senior folks. It's like, we all do have to communicate. So that it is a more open space. And even if you're feeling nervous on set now, I would say like, it's even easier to make better connections on set now. So that's been the most surprising change for me, I think. That's really interesting. Thank you uh, for that. How about you, Sam? Uh, have anything to add to that? What, what was the most shocking change you encountered post-graduation in relation to industry reactions to the pandemic? Yeah, um, I think I'm going to have the least relevant answer. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that that point about people being friendlier, especially now as like going back into an office, right? Um, I think that's the big thing. So just like taking advantage that there is a moment to be like taken advantage of where people are more willing to connect and more willing to talk and like more excited to have a 10 minute office conversation with someone like three levels more junior than them. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Sam. How about you, Elizabeth? Yeah, I think it's kind of, it's a tough question for me because, you know, I'm still getting into the industry and, or, you know, the entire time that I've been networking and trying to break in has been during the pandemic. And so nothing has necessarily changed. Uh, you know, it's just been consistent. Uh, but I think something that I've been noticing recently as people are transitioning back to in-person or just that I've been doing this, you know, taking the interviews as long as I have, um, people have gotten a lot more like open to, um, you know, the fact that I guess like in the past when everybody was in person, uh, they would expect someone with an assistant or applying for an assistant role to have certain, you know, certain things on their resume or have experience with, um, you know, certain things that you can't do in a virtual environment, you know, phone calls, um, mailroom duties and stuff. And so people have gotten a lot more understanding of that. And so, there's been an opportunity for me to more showcase like the transferable skills and things that I've been doing in the meantime, you know, playing into, I know that I don't have, you know, I know that I haven't been able to get this exact experience and it's, you know, because of the pandemic. And so sort of leaning into that as a way um, to like empathize with people in the interviews and just, you know, showcase how you're trying to make up for it you know um and so it's like created that sort of opportunity yeah gotcha thank you all right we're gonna jump into our chat and we're gonna go ahead and take a question from samantha so samantha says i am in ambivert but i find initial meetings very difficult as that's uh where and when i get more introverted how do introverts make those connections and maintain their positioning in the industry um whoever wants to jump on that maybe sam maybe elizabeth rain uh you yeah want to go, sam? Oh, go ahead go ahead okay, you go sam thank you okay um i am fairly extroverted but i do find initial meetings over zoom excruciating and i do find following up excruciating um and actually elizabeth mentioned it earlier i think the um when you are meeting people virtually you get to have notes and they can't see them um and that is so helpful um especially like if I schedule like 15 minutes with someone, write more than 15 minutes worth of questions and like, I'm good. Like I don't even have to worry about it um, and I will get through it. And people will be happy leaving that conversation because like, unless my questions are terrible somehow, like people love talking about themselves. Um, so that's a good way to make a good impression. And then with regards to like staying in touch and following up, um, I made this point in the last one, but like, again, like no one knows how you're feeling when you send that email, like 
it can be excruciating to hit send on a follow-up email. And like, I, yeah, I know for me, like I feel super self-conscious about it. I feel like I'm bothering people. I'm not, um, you know, I feel like they don't want to hear from me. Maybe they do, maybe they don't, but like, it's going to be positive or neutral. Like they're not upset to be hearing from me um, unless I'm spamming them, which I'm not. Um, so it's just like clicking send and like by doing it over and over again, it, it does get easier. Um, but especially initially, it's just, I get it. It's hard. Um, but like kind of barreling through and doing it anyway, um, has really been helpful and like, kind of like building that muscle. Gotcha. Thank you. How about you, Rain? How do, uh, in your in your um, perspective, how do introverts make those connections and maintain their positioning in the industry? Mm -hmm. um, so I am also an ambivert, uh, Samantha. So I totally get it. Um, it is a bit of a drainer meeting people initially. So my biggest, um, I guess, like life hack on that is. Um, like practicing the conversation. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like maybe introverts, uh, other introverts do this, but I really do like think about the way that the conversation might go. So I'm playing it out in a couple of different ways, which is like exhausting, but that's what makes me feel like prepared and confident for those uh, like initial meetings. Um, one of the key things that I learned, uh, I think in like at an FMS like event in undergrad is like when you're meeting someone new initially, it's really good to like uh, number one, like Sam said, ask them something about themselves, but also like hang on to a piece of information that you can follow up with later. So I make it a point in like initial meetings to like ask what their favorite movie is or ask what they've been reading lately or figure out something that I can like use to as an introduction later, if that makes sense. And that's going to help you like feel more connected to this person anyways. Um, and it's like something you want to know about them. It's something that they probably want to share. And then it's easier for you to make a follow-up with them uh, by being like, like once I met this woman who we were talking about our favorite movies and I, this movie theater in her town was showing that movie on 35 millimeter. And I was like, oh my gosh, did you see this? Also, how are you doing? Like, <laughs> so it's nice to prepare yourself in that way. Um, that can seem like, I know it can seem kind of crazy to do that, but it, it's going to help you feel a lot more confident when you go into these initial meetings, because you have something that you're, that you have something, you have a goal in mind that isn't just like, all right, I'm going to introduce myself to this person. Um, and it's beneficial, it's mutually beneficial that way. So that's what makes me feel better. Um, especially maintaining those connections. If you have something to talk about, that's not just you and them like individually if you have something to build that connection between it's really helpful so gotcha thank you elizabeth uh same question um how do uh, introverts make those connections and maintain their positioning in the industry especially at those initial interactions and meetings yeah i think the the biggest thing is just that practice makes perfect and so you know, the more often you do it, the more it'll become a bit more natural. And so, you know, while you're in school, you know, you can sort of practice with your professors, you know, go, you know, reaching out to them and going to their office hours, sort of pretend like it's that sort of networking thing, you know, and they will be a part of your network, you know, so just, I guess, like practice the conversations while you can, or, you know, whenever you can. And then as far as like sending those emails, of like a cold open and stuff, you know, like we've said, no one knows how you're feeling when you press that button. And, you know, the way that I like to think about it is like, you know, if you don't send the email, you're never going to have that connection. So the worst thing that could happen, if you do send it, they never respond and you're just kind of back to where you were. And so, you know, taking that risk and just doing it, um, you know, you don't really have a lot to lose other than, you know, just going back to where you were. And so, trying to sort of reframe it um, before you go into those conversations, before you write those emails, um, you know, just try to try to trick yourself a little bit, um, you know, change your, try to change that mindset a little bit um, and hopefully it'll make it a bit easier. Gotcha. I appreciate it. I believe those are all of our questions. I think uh, they are. Yeah. 
think they are, which is lovely. We are really right on time. So hopefully all of you who are here can get where you need to go next on time. Um, thank you so much, um, our alumni panelists, our moderators. Um, thank you just for participating in today's event. Um, thank you all for those of you who came um, in attendance and also be on the lookout because we have our final panel in the series taking place um, on Friday, April 8th, also from 10 to 11. So you will be notified about that, but um, put that on your calendar. We'd love to have you back. So thank you all and have a good rest of your day. Feel free to reach out if you have questions.